Essential pediatrics, you can't really cover much pediatrics in a half an hour, but there are some key things I'd like to cover. Uh, I want to cover a little bit about uh, fluids. I want to kind of cover a little bit about um, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, those kinds of things in little kitties, because that's a common I issue. Um, we're going to do another talk in a couple of days about pediatric fever, which is the big bugaboo. What do we do? What's the appropriate workup? Those kinds of things. Kids are fun. Um, right off the bat, there's a, an, an Aptala issue. Some kid is in the playground and falls over and hits his head on the, on the hard cement, comes in, got a good egg in his uh, occipital area, is vomiting a couple times and keeps on asking the same question over and over. Do you have to get his parents' permission to do a CAT scan in that kid? You know, absolutely not, because Imtala basically says that it's your job to find out whether this, this kid has an emergency as defined by the Healthcare Financing Administration, and, and if this emergency is potentially serious, that it needs to be identified immediately. So this kid, if he's got a bleed in his head, we want to know that, and um, we don't need to ask parents to do that, because Imtala doesn't have a parentheses if the parents have been approved or, or, or contacted, no. Um, these are the ones who, kids who don't have to have their parental consent either, like child abuse, obviously don't have a parental consent for that. Pregnancy, STDs, and some um, mood-related disorders, depending on the state. I think, I know of two $40 million plus, $40 million plus cases of uh, lawsuits involving uh, failure to recognize child abuse. Uh, and both of them related to they are really to appreciate what the nurses were saying and then, uh, and then really not paying attention to it and not really putting two and two together and, and the person, the kid, was sent out. And the history is always the same. So the, kid, the kid had a, a abuse. It was not picked up. The kid comes back a month later. Now he's got a, you know, a compound skull, skull fracture or the like. He's got permanent brain injury and will need lifelong care thereafter. And so bottom line is that there's a uh, failure to report child abuse, which is a state law, and you didn't do it, so you broke the law, so, and your malpractice insurance doesn't cover you breaking the law. And there's a malpractice case because had you identified this child, maybe this uh, outcome would not have occurred. So you've got a criminal uh, charges against you and a malpractice suit against you and uh, it, they can be a astronomical. So in these cases, really, really, really get together with the nurses, think about it a little bit, is this potentially a child abuse? Because if other people think it is, and you missed it, there is, there is uh, substantial issues. Uh, the, the, the next people are the people who don't necessarily ha have to be uh, had their parents. That's because they're emancipated. So if you're in the military, you're emancipated. If you're married, you're emancipated. If you are independent out and living on your own, like you have a kid who went to college and now he's independent living in, on his own, well, those are reportable cases. They don't exist, kids uh, coming from college and living on their own. Uh, they come home with a suitcase. Mom and Dad, I'm back. I'm trying to find myself. Well, I found you. You're right here. You know, in the house again. Um, it's interesting because some of the uh, child act uh, actresses and actors became emancipated minors, so they didn't have to go to school. I think Drew Barrymore was one. There's a, there's a raft of them, a handful of them, that basically got their lawyers to say, "I'm an emancipated minor." The parents basically said, "Okay, you're an emancipated minor, so we can don't have to follow all the rules about what has to be done with child actors." Keep the family in a room with the kid, absolutely, absolutely. You can't do this show without the audience, and the audience is the parents. And the show is basically going to be your exam of this kid to make it clear that you've done a really good job. Sure, you're going to get, get the history, and, uh, you, but everybody expects you to do the physical. And I mentioned before, kids this big. So bottom line is you have to look at everything. And while you're looking, you're verbalizing. Mom, uh, I don't see any evidence of dehydration. The, the, the child's crying with tears. The mouth is wet. I don't, the skin uh, feels perfectly normal. Let me take a listen to the lungs. You take a listen. Uh, the lungs are good, Mom. Heart, heart sounds fine, okay? Put the belly, a stomach on the, 
abdomen. Not that you'll ever hear anything that matters. Mm, it's okay, ma. Sounds okay there. To feel, feel around everything, ch chest, feel, range of motion, of extremities. You know, put the stuff on the pellet, patella. Uh, patella is okay, ma. That's, uh, everything, you know, you do, you verbalize in the process. And then they say, boy, that was very thorough. You look in the ears, look in the mouth. Yeah, very thorough, very thorough. Good, did a good job. So you can't do that without the audience there. So if they're still in registration or still, still like, you got to wait for the audience to come in. Plus, you're going to ask the parents, you know, the questions that are going to help you out through this. Obviously, you're supposed to have the right equipment. In California, in Los Angeles, they had a thing called EDAP, Emergency Department Approved for Pediatrics, which meant that you had to have nurses who took the PALS course and the doctors had to be boarded and um, you had to have a list of equipment that was uh, approved for the use of kids, including, this is how ridiculous it got, pediatric rib spreaders. Nobody knew how to use pediatric rib spreaders. They were on the list. Uh, that was part of you being an emergency department approved for pediatrics. Dosing errors, you, you, yeah, obviously those are an issue because there's so many weight-dependent kind of thing. The, the Braslow tape, is one way, but now the Brazo has a very sophisticated way, and I, I, I'm sure there's others too, where they can read the barcode on the, on the uh, bottle. The barcode on the bottle tells them that what drug it is and what concentration of that drug. You put, it, you put in the weight into the software program, and it says, here, give three cc's of this. Inconsolable crying, that is a kind of a distressing issue. You got a baby, and it just will not stop crying. Well, in my experience, a lot of those babies stop crying right in the emergency department. They sit looking around, and you know, and mom kind of feels a little foolish because the kid's been uh, crying a lot. But you still, you got to go over them, and you and you're looking. If they're young children, you know, in the first couple of months, you're talking about potentially, is this colic? Well, colic is a diagnosis of exclusion. Colic is three hours a day, three days a week for three consecutive weeks, 13%. There's all threes here. 13% of, of young kids get colic. We, some people call it intestinal colic. And as soon as you call it intestinal colic, the implication is, well, the cause is intestinal. Well, we don't really know that. And one of the things that people start doing is, well, let's change the diet from, let's put them on a soybean diet, a soy diet, or something like that, because it's, this, this diet isn't agreeing with them. Generally, the parents find some kind of maneuvers which makes the, the child calm down. You know, I've heard of people putting the kid on the top of the dryer while the dryer is vibrating. That kind of, you know, it's, it's better to put, put the kid on the top than inside. But you can envision that uh, when parents are sub subjected to a crying child, the mother is sleep deprived as it is. The, the child is crying all the time. And uh, you can see the potential environment for some uh, abuse of the child, particularly the mother's boyfriend. When there's a problem, look for the mother's boyfriend because that, that boyfriend has no stake in that child. All that that child is doing is screwing up everything. So inconsolable trying, we're going to put the intestinal conflict away. We're going to look for evidence of trauma. We're going to look for... Any bruising, or we're going to do the joints move and the child move the extremities normally without any kind of evidence of you know not not moving it normally. We're going to take the diaper off. You have to take the diaper off because a lot of stuff we're going to look for is under the there. We're going to feel the chest wall. Is there any tenderness in the ribs? Because ribs are among the most common things broken because these kids grab really hard and this circle of ribs that they have crack. So you see multiple uh, ribs uh, um, healing. Trauma is a chest, trauma in the belly, you're looking for the, the bruises, you're looking for any kind of burns, any kind of rashes that, that may be caused by somebody. Have you ever seen this thing where uh, under, underneath the diaper the mom's hair is going around a kid's penis? Is that weird or what? How many have seen that? Let's see here. Look, we just did a clinical study. I'd say about 32% of the audience has seen this uh, hair around the... And they also can do around the finger, but the penis is much more interesting. Um, corneal, corneal abrasions, they say that you should look in the list, oh, that should be on the list. I'm not interested in looking at any kid's eye for a corneal abrasion. Yeah, I mean, their, their hands, hands are moving and they got maybe sharp nails and, they're, uh, and they're, it's like they move in like a brownian movement kind of thing. And sure, they might hit, hit their eye. 
But have you ever tried to put fluorescein in a uh, six-month-old's eye? It's, it's everybody's wearing fluorescein here by the time you're done kind of thing. Uh, and the kid, try to get that lid open. That kid, that, that thing is clamped down now. That lid is not open for anybody. And the kid's crying, there's fluorescein all over. Mom's looking at you like, what the heck are you trying to do here? No, I don't care about that. You know, it'll heal in a couple of days. Um, actually, there have been studies that have looked at kids' corneas, and they have found corneal staining, little, little lines of corneal staining, not, not, uh, not obviously bad, bad uh, evidence of where corneal staining was. But, so I'm personally not, not going to do that. I tried it too many times. It doesn't work. So we're also looking for meningitis. Mom, no, there's no evidence of meningitis. Ma, ma, the kid's head's very neck supple kind of thing. And when you, say, and you do that in front of mom, mom says, yeah, they, they, they check the neck, they check the neck. No rash, I don't see any rash, ma. Um, no, no, you don't, don't use the word petechia, no, no rash. So we're looking for painful things. Meningitis may be, otitis we know, is, we sure know that's painful. Maybe urinary tract is painful. So maybe the kid's got some uh, diarrhea that may be causing abdominal cramps, but it's certainly not gonna be generally a protracted kind of thing of the kid's crying and I don't, don't know why. And, you know, there's all of this stuff under the diaper in terms of the hernias that, that, that Jan mentioned, the um, an, uh, fissure, uh, an anal fissure, because the, the bowel movement is real tough, and it's going through there making a little ripping, and so that, that, that's painful. Um, testicular torsion. Well, you've seen these kids where they get these horrible diaper rashes, but you would never have known that had you not taken off the... the uh, the diaper, and, and he's like, what the heck is going on here? And mom kind of thinks, well, this is my first baby. I, I, I know people get diaper rash. I thought, I thought it was a normal diaper rash. Well, this is a bad diaper rash, and it's like a burn, so it hurts the kid. Neonatal jaundice, is, that's the most common reason for a newborn coming back to the hospital is that they're t turning yellow. And uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. The idea here is that, that fetal red cells are, are going to be eaten up by the you know, the lymphatic system and it is destroyed. And in the process, their hemoglobin that's in those fetal red cells basically has to be converted to um, bilirubin through the hepatic process. And so th there's just too many red cells try that are being broken down, which overwhelms the liver's ability to, to conjugate that. You, it will only go out through the biliary tree and out the, uh, into the middle portion of the duodenum, through the, the sphincter there, It'll only do that if it's conjugated, which is res the result of an enzymatic process. So if the liver is not capable of handling all of this extra red cells, then the, 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 the um, bilirubin uh, flushes back into the, the stuff that was in the liver, kind of goes back into the bloodstream, and now the kid's turning yellow. And so we're concerned about this cornicterus because at a certain concentration, this stuff will pass into the brain. It's considered neurotoxic. And kids who have died from cornicterus, which is obviously not very common, but pictures in the past, they would have to take a section of the kid's brain, and it, it would be yellow from the diffuse infiltration of the uh, brain by um, bilirubin. But in any case, there's a, there's a chart that basically says how high the bilirubin is and, and how old the kid is and that bilirubin is this high when they go under the billy lights. That's not really going to be your choice, but the key thing is you've got to measure the, the bilirubin and you need to know the ratio of direct acting to indirect. Direct acting is conjugated bilirubin, indirect is unconjugated. The unconjugated should be the predominant uh, bilirubin you found. The unconjugated is the stuff the liver just but not, has not been able to handle. Um, and the conjugated is stuff that the liver has been able to handle. It's going out through the, um, uh, into the small bowel. If it was re reversed, what happens if the, the largest number is the conjugated bilirubin? That means conjugated bilirubin was worked on by the liver, it's been conjugated, but it can't go out the biliary tree, so it flushes back into the bloodstream. That means there's something wrong with the biliary tree. In term, you've heard of biliary atresia. Well, that's one of the signs is that you have a conjugated bilirubin level that is higher than the uh, unconjugated level. You also do a Coombs test. A Coombs test is uh, one of those tests to see if there are preformed red cells, uh, preformed antibodies that attack red cells. 
Uh, that's kind of done it also in blood transfusions, where as a transfusion reaction, they do a Coombs test. The Coombs test is to see whether there's preformed globulin antibodies st sticking onto the red cells and destroying them. So the positive Coombs test means that you are lysing red cells um, as a re result of this immunologic process. Breast breastfeeding is another cause of uh, jaundice. Mother's milk can excrete glucuronyl transferase in inhibitor, glucuronyl transferase inhibitor. Glucuronyl transferase is the enzyme needed to help go from bilirubin unconjugated to bilirubin conjugated. So if the child's getting a good shot of glucuronyl transferase inhibitor, that might be a cause for the bilirubin to go up as well. In this case, it occurs substantially longer away from the birth than the, the, the physiologic joint is a couple of days after birth where this huge load of red cells is being asked to be worked on. The other part is, is like 10, 20 days after uh, the baby's been born, that's, and they notice the bilirubin's going up, baby's turning yellow, bring them in the ER. That may be the uh, problem then. The idea, one of the ideas is to hydrate this child up substantially, try, to stop, try not to have to stop breastfeeding depending on the, what the level is. So again, this is, uh, you put it on the graph, the chart tells you um, how high and whether they need to be under the billy lights. Uh, I don't think I w wanna go through, <laughs> I thought this was, this was, I put this up there just for fun. <laughs> we were, oh, well, let's go through the billy, billy ribbon cycle here. No, no, no. Um, vomiting in kids. Common, common problem. So your job is to distinguish from significant vomiting from non-significant vomiting in terms of what is the cause, not so much in terms of severity, because even if a kid has gastroenteritis, they could vomit enough so that they become um, uh, hypoglycemic. They, they become, about 10% of kids who have persistent vomiting have uh, hypoglycemia. So it's a good idea to do a, 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 a a stick of their finger in the kids who are having a significant amount of vomiting. What you don't need to do in kids who are vomiting generally is don't do any kind of, you know, co comprehensive metabolic panel and all that stuff. Once you get the problem fixed and they started taking in, in calories, then they will, re they will resolve their metabolic acidosis that they have, and all of those problems will, will uh, get, go away. So this is not an idea where um, you have to start tracing, uh, chasing uh, lab tests. So the, here's the differential. Okay, well, uh, yeah, we've got to be vomiting, not just spitting up here. Sure, a bunch of infections can call it, cause it. Kids have a, you know, a rather stereotypical response to their stressors. They, they, they vomit. If you, know, they, they, if you look at them cr cricket, they might vomit kind of thing. It's just, it's just what they do. So infections can do it. Habatopiliary disease says these kids are yellow when they're vomiting. That's a kind of like a, a bad sign. We, th we think that it may be normal, but if a kid vomits bile, that's not normal. And biliary um, vomiting is a suggestion that, I mentioned that the bile ducts enter the middle part of the duodenum. So they come in there, and if you have an obstruction here, then vomiting is going to take all that bile and it's going to go out the stomach. It's not going to go passed down. So these are obstructions just beyond the ampulla vata where the bile would em empty. So biliary, uh, bilious vomiting is considered to be dangerous. And you've got to consider, is this a manifestation of um, malrotation of the gut? Malrotation of the gut can uh, manifest itself at any time. I mean, there are adults who have malrotation of the gut who have no symptoms whatsoever. There are little kids within the first week or two or three weeks uh, their manifestations of malrotation are such that they, an obstruction is caused by this malrotation. This obstruction basically uh, d does not allow the bili bilirubin to go south, so it goes north and it comes out when they vomit. So malrotation of the gut is what you think about, number one, if they have bilious vomiting. You know, we know, we'll talk a little bit more about pyloric stenosis, incarcerated hernias, uh, Jan talked about that. Increased intracranial pressure, we know that that is a source of vomiting. A bloated head, that's a source of vomiting. And in the susception, we'll talk about that as well. There's good old odantitron on the bottom. You know, it's kind of hard to think of. Have you ever been any, aware of anybody who got like too much odantitron? Is, is there like a problem with giving, uh, you know, 
I've never heard of an overdose of odantitron causing any kind of symptoms. I mean, this drug is really quite, quite benign, I think. So let's talk about some infections causing diarrhea. Now, there, you, we could spend an hour talking about diarrhea and infections, but Jan mentioned um, that uh, we have our options of bacterial diarrhea or viral diarrhea. Viral diarrhea tend, tend to occur in the, in the winter, and um, rotavirus is still around. Like you, you'll notice in, in the slide here, it says the rotavirus vaccines will take care of 90% or so plus of the really bad rotavirus infections. But mild infections, it only handles about two-thirds of those. So a little kid can certainly have a rotavirus in infection, mild uh, source of uh, diarrhea. Uh, the summertime di diarrheas are, Jan mentions uh, Shigella and Salmonella. And um, Staph is kind of interesting. Staph is basically a preformed exotoxin. So this Staph is growing, 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 multiplying, and in the process of growing, 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 it's making this exotoxin. So as soon as you ingest this stuff, this exotoxin is already down in your uh, uh, stomach, going into your uh, bloodstream, causing this vomiting within you know, an hour or two after eating this contaminated food because this bacteria doesn't need to grow down there. It's not like Salmonella or Sagella where we need to multiply it down there. No, no, this has got exotoxins. It's just, you take it in, causes, uh, you know, vomiting and diarrhea. I remember really a good case to make the point that um, Shigella is, um, Jan mentioned this neurotoxin. So kids who come in with high fever and diarrhea, it, you know, you just bet it's Shigella it, um, if, if they've have, had a seizure because of this neurotoxin. Uh, I remember we were doing a, a lumbar puncture on a kid who had a, a febrile seizure, we thought. And in the process of turning this kid into a U to do the lumbar puncture, the uh, EMT was holding him on that side, did one of these kind of things, and out come the sample that we were really looking for, out his butt. He just kind of squirted this kid. But uh, I don't recommend you do that, but it's a good way to get a, a sample of the diarrhea. He had not had any diarrhea before, and out came this bloody bowel movement, making the diagnosis of Shigella, so we didn't really have to do a tap anymore. Blood in the stool, I like this one, because everybody gets a little panic when there's blood in the stool. If the, if the stool is generally decently formed and there's a streak of blood on it, kind of top, well, maybe that's, you know, a fistula in the anus. Maybe there's maybe a little blood vessel break somewhere in the colon kind of thing. It's not like the stool's all mixed in with blood kind of thing. It's, and so it really, if the child is well, vital signs are okay, belly is soft, child, child is happy, playful, eating, and they had some blood in the stool, then basically that could come up, can go home and come back if there's any kind of new or worsening problems. But it, it'll generally resolve on its own, and it doesn't need any kind of workup in terms of, uh, unless you have see other things in this child that make it, makes you suggest that there's a problem here. Blood in the stool is, uh, what, else, what else here? Cow's milk intolerance, yeah, I guess, I guess that could cause a little, some people think that that's a pretty uh, common cause because, you know, this is um, lactose in, in insufficiency kind of thing, you know, and it causes some issues where the bowels can bleed. Uh, that's one thought. Um, the, the, the wackiest one I've ever heard of is swallowed maternal blood. Have you ever heard of that as a cause of blood in the stool in the kid? Well, first of all, if you swallow blood, it turns black from the stomach acid right away. So it's not going to come out red. It's going to be black. And, you know, can you think of this kid on this nipple here? extracting enough blood from this mother that it's going to turn it, have blood in its stool. It's like a little vampire on the, on the left breast there. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. Pyloric stenosis is, uh, these are white males, northern European. Uh, they tend to be, 30% uh, uh, of them or so are, are in the, newbornish kind of thing, firstborn uh, area. These are kind of cool. These are easy cases. It's basically the kid is hungry, vomits, hungry, vomit, bottle, vomit, bottle, vomit. Um, and it's generally pretty forceful vomiting. And the abdomen, you feel around, belly's usually nice and soft. It's not distended or anything like that. 
And then there's an olive. There's uh, an olive that big that you can feel in the epigastrium where the pylorus is. And uh, ideally now, if you have ultrasound, you can make the diagnosis pretty much immediately. It, it looks like a circle within a circle kind of thing. It looks like a donut within a donut. Um, because of this is a thickness around the pylorus. In the United States, uh, they generally handle it with surgery. In uh, places like Japan and such, they give um, low-dose atropine for long periods of time. But the olive is very cool to feel. You can envision if the kid keeps on vomiting, keeps on vomiting, he's vomiting out all of this hydrochloric acid. So he becomes, he, he is vomiting out acid. So as a result, the kid becomes alkalotic. When people become alkalotic, their, their K goes down. So you can get a hypochloremic alkalosis. So the kid became, can, can become alkalotic. Although, again, if you've made the diagnosis and we're, when we're able to fix it, when you fix it, you know, in this kid who's basically starving, he gets some you know, IV fluids, so some glucose, and he'll, he'll perk up, and then he needs to have this thing uh, operated on. Diarrhea, uh, oh, did I go the wrong way here? Sorry about that. And the susception's pretty cool as well. Where does it occur? Where the small bowel meets the large bowel on the right, uh, on the right side. And so this, the, the, we're talking about the cecum. Well, where is the cecum? The cecum is down where the appendix is. So it, the cecum's down in here someplace. So small bowel invaginates into the large bowel. So where is that going to be? That's going to be in the right, right hand side of the body. It's basically where the uh, uh, ascending colon kind of goes around. Um, so you're looking for a tube shaped mass that you can palpate on the right-hand side of the kid's abdomen. There are some very characteristic things about how these people, um, how these kids react to the pain of this process in that they are extremely uh, agitated and upset. They're red, their legs are bicycling kind of round because they're so distressed kind of thing. And all of a sudden they kind of just go, get quiet and silent and they become very listless. And then the next thing you know, they're bicycling uh, uh, again. And that pain pattern is consistent with this diagnosis. Current generally stools, a late binding, don't, don't wait to see that, it won't necessarily be there. And here's the ultrasound that basically shows you how easily this diagnosis can be made, but you have to consider it. If you don't consider it, you won't make it. Brief unresolved, uh, this is brief, I like the old name better to tell you the truth. Brief resolved unknown uh, episode here, unexplained episode. This is kind of complex because this is the American Academy of Pediatrics saying, don't do these tests in a kid who has a low-risk brewing. But if they have a low-risk brew, then you have to know all of the criteria to make a kid low-risk. So basically, there are, some of them are listed here. It has to be, you know, last less than a minute, and it has to be in a kid less than one, and he has to have one of these four things happen uh, to them. They can turn red, blue, white, you know, those color things. Um, movement is issues, respiratory issues, all of those things, if they lasted for less than a minute, in a kid who meets the quiet criteria for low risk, the, the AAP says you don't need to do a big workup uh, on them at all. So, uh, but this article that we're talking about in pediatrics in May 2016 is the definitive article, and that's the article that if you really want to get involved in this uh, diagnosis, you have to basically read all the exclusions because there are a, a lot of them. Otherwise, th basically this child, after this episode, when he comes into you, has to be perfectly well, it, it, back at baseline. There can't be any residual of this, uh, of this episode when you see the child. He's got to be perfectly well, and he can't be sick in any way. He can't have a runny nose, he can't have a cold. If he has a cold, he does not meet the criteria for a low-risk uh, one of these events. So, and you need to know that because it, you know, my th ah, all kids, all, all kids have colds. This is more, this is more of the same. They talk about shared decision making. It's kind of like, well, Ma, what do you want to do? Well, what does Mom know about this? I think the idea is for you basically to say, Mom, we're going to open the child. Uh, there's and no evidence of anything seriously going on here. Let's observe the child for a period of time to see how he or she does, and then we'll go from there. That's, I think, your job. I don't think you need to rush him out the door. One of the things about, about ER is let's get him in and out quickly, and I, I, I'm a big believer in that, but this is not one kid to get out quickly. 
simple febrile seizures six, between six and uh, months and six years. You've seen them all, basically, grand mal seizure, bilateral, um, lasts a relatively short time. They said um, up to five minutes. I, I, five minutes is a long time for a seizure in any case. Um, after the seizure is over, there's no residual, there's no unilateral weakness, there's no Todd's paralysis. The kid's up, w running around the department, terrorizing the department. I mean, you've seen a lot of those cases, and basically, what kind of workup needs to be done? You think, well, what, I, I need to order something, for crying out loud. Actually, you, know, you don't need to order anything. You just need to feel confident that this is a civil, simple febrile seizure. There's often a family history of seizures that goes along with this. Um, this is one of the reasons not to marry your cousin. Um, and a small percentage of them, 2%, may go on to having uh, epilepsy. But in the majority of cases, it's mother needs reassurance. And, and many times, they're not really all that upset because they know other members of the family who, who have had this because it does run in families. The key uh, here is, is that it cannot be in any way unilateral, and there can no be, not be any prior neurologic disorder. If there's any prior neurologic disorder, th no matter how much it looks like a simple febrile seizure, it d is not qualified as one if there's any kind of prior neurologic problem. So here's a complex febrile seizures. Focal, it's only, it's only one arm kind of thing. Prolonged, more than 15 minutes, that sounds like status to me. Multiple seizures in a row. Um, residual paralysis, Todd's paralysis, kid won't move his arm kind of thing. If any of those things happen in the setting of what is a febrile seizure, that kid needs to complete full McGilla workup. Non-febrile seizures, um, what would be a cause of non-febrile seizures? Well, here's a list to consider. Uh, why would a kid become hyponatremic? Um, well, the only way they really could become hyponatremic is if they could become water intoxicated. Mom basically took your advice and, give, and, and you said give plenty of fluids, and she gave plenty of fluids. Basically, she diluted this kid's down, the sodium down to 115, the kid has a seizure. Um, because she's been giving fluid, 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 fluids. That's particularly true in little babies where you prop up this bottle, and this bottle is propped up into their mouths kind of thing, and they're, they're going to drink a lot of water. So the hyponatremia is there, is there. The other one I like on here is INH. Um, there's certain populations who have a lot of positive skin tests, and then they get put on INH to kind of kill the TB bugs. And... Uh, I was in the Indian Health Service for a couple of years, and um, American Indians, big, uh, despite the fact that they have um, uh, the uh, health care provided to all of them by the Indian Health Service, there was a lot of positive cases of, uh, I, uh, and there were a lot of people on INH, and that's where we saw seizures because what would you overdose on in, in the Indian Health Services? INH and alcohol are the two overdoses. And if you don't know about this cause, this INH, then you'll get, give all the benzos you, you, you want, and it's not going to stop the seizure. The seizure needs to be stopped by giving B6, ideally in the quantity that, the, uh, that was, was taken. But this is one of the things where the kid's going into grandma's purse while she's visiting and taking out some of this stuff can cause this kind of problem. Pediatric dehydration. Um, I, I, I think I'm a little behind. One of the things they say about this is don't take this stuff too seriously in terms of I got to go through this list of all of the uh, mild dehydration, moderate dehydration, serious dehydration, capillary refill, you know, you, your gestalt at looking at that kid is going to be that the vast majority of these kids who have had a lot of vomiting or whatever are going to be mildly to moderately dehydrated. Severe dehydration is still really going to be very uncommon. That being the case, all you got to remember is a couple of, couple of things. Mild dehydration is about 50 mL per kilo, moderate is 100, and, uh, and severe would be in the neighborhood of a, a 150 um, mL per kilo. Is that. That's what the kid's down. Mild, moderate. And so if most kids are between mild and moderate dehydration, you're not supposed to start IVs in these kids. They're supposed to get the sippy diet. 
AAPA says there are way too many IVs being started in these mild and moderate dehydrations, which are the vast majority of them. So don't do that. Give the sippy diet. Here's the Pedialyte kind of thing. Here's a modantitron. Mom, <coughs> you feed the child this, and we'll, we'll, we'll get them to the take down you know, a bottle or half a bottle, that kind of thing. If they're severely dehydrated, they could, these boluses of 20 ml per, per kilo of normal saline bolus, wait 15 minutes, 20 minutes, give another bolus, wait 15, 20 minutes, give another bolus. As soon as you're given three boluses, that's 60 ml per kilo, they are now technically moderately dehydrated. And, but once you've started the IV, you might as well continue hydrating them uh, that way rather than orally. And this is the last thing I think I want to cover is what is the maintenance fluid of a, of a kid? How much fluid does a kid need to, to maintain their, their body metabolism? And the, I think the, the one I want to mention first is if you have a 10 kilogram kid, which is 22 pounds, that's a one year older. A one year older generally weighs around 22. The maintenance fluids for a kid is um, 100 mLs per kilo for the first 10 kilos. That means a one year old kid this big needs a liter of water a day. A liter of water a day for that little kid? Yeah, a liter. So if this kid's got any reason not to be taking fluids in, has got any kind of something going on in the mouth or, 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 or not taking fluids, they can get way behind. They have a fever. They're not feeling well. They're not taking fluids. It's easy for them to get behind. So that gives you a perspective of what a little kid is a one-year-old a liter. You put a liter beside a one-year-old kid, you'd never think that was the uh, maintenance dose for that kid. Um, I, we don't need to do the APGAR score. And then there's a list of all the things for pediatric resuscitations. Remember, these are all respiratory focused. They're all about st stimulating, s s you know, airway, tube in the nose kind of thing, um, oxygen supplementation, intubation if you need to. And then there's a list of all of the routine stuff for uh, resuscitation.